we go. Okay. All right. Let's see. This works. I'm pretty loud, so I want to be. What's that? Yeah, for the screen. That's exciting for me. Is it accurate? Cool. I have, I have bad hearing, and so uh, that's really cool to see that. All right. Anyway, I'll get started. So um, this is a photograph of a really special person who I'd like to introduce you to today. How many people know who this person is? OK. A few of you? Cool. Um, so this is Harry Smith. I first saw this photograph um, when I was a teenager. I think I was about 14 or 15 years old. <coughs> and I was at my friend uh, Stinky's house. Uh, he's my best friend. His name is Matt. But I've called him Stinky his whole life. And um, the thing about this photograph is that it was in a book of photographs by Allen Ginsberg, who was a favorite poet of mine at the time. I fancied myself a bit of a poet when I was a teenager, as many of you did, I'm sure, and I hope many of you still do. Um, and so it's a really interesting photograph. I had no idea who this individual was. And the caption is really funny. It says, Harry Smith, painter, architect, anthropologist, filmmaker, and hermetic alchemist, his last week at Breslin Hotel, Manhattan, January 12, 1985, transforming milk into milk. <laughs> so, of course, I had to know who, who was this person? You know, why was he in this book of Ginsburg photographs? Was he a poet? What, who was he? So um, I did a little bit more digging. I found a photograph of him when he was younger. Looked like he had some pretty interesting things going on earlier in his life as well. Um, he, you can tell from that smile he has a lot of knowledge in his head. Um, <laughs> So uh, it took me a long time to figure out information about him because at that time it just you know it was just a little bit more challenging to figure out not only basic facts about an individual but to get your hands on the media was particularly challenging. So it turns out that he was all those things that Ginsburg said he was and a lot more. He was a anthropologist by trade. He was a linguist, a translator, a painter, and perhaps most of all he was a collector, um, a very obsessive collector. And so I'm going to read you a quote about him. Uh, this quote and a lot of the images in this presentation are um, in part due to the good work of the Getty Research Institute, which is part of the Getty Museum uh, in Los Angeles. So they preserved a lot of his collections and a lot of photographs of him and did research about him and wrote about him. So you're all reading this quote on the screen, which is why I put it there, so that's good. Um, Harry Smith liked to look for keys to the universal patterns that shape our cultures and the hidden realms of the human unconscious. He compared patterns in Native American music with eccentric rhythms of jazz, the patterns in seminal patchwork with those on Ukrainian Easter eggs, the intricate diagrams of master occultists with the ambient rhythms of the sound of New York street life, and somehow assembled from these a harmonic web of cosmographic ideas employing all the investigative rigor of, an er of his early anthropological training. That sounds pretty cool, right? So he was a collector. And so um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to show you. I'm not going to tell you so much anymore. I'm going to show you some of the things that he collected. I'll tell you a little bit about them, but I'm going to show you them too. So first of all, and perhaps most famously, he's a Grammy Award-winning ethnomusicologist. He collected sounds. So um, he also you know, he collected recorded sound, but he also recorded sound himself. So some of the recorded sounds he collected, he presented in this 1952 uh, Epic released three double albums with booklets called the Anthology of American Folk Music. He collected 84 songs from the mid-20s to the early 30s and released them in three volumes, songs, um, social music, and ballads. And so he released this in 1952 after collecting this music for a long time. And you can imagine that in the 40s and 50s, you know, no one collecting records wasn't really a thing. These were not artifacts that people really cared about. No one thought that you would want to keep them around or had any idea that this music would be lost along with the media. So the fact that he decided to collect them and document them in that anthropological way was very special because what happened is he in ended up influencing quite a lot of people by releasing this music that would have otherwise been lost to history, including Joan Baez, um, a somewhat well-known folk singer in these parts named Bob Dylan, who was not only influenced by this music, he covered some of these songs and, and used a lot of them in, in his music. And, and this also influenced a, a personal favorite musician of mine, less well known but equally brilliant. His name is John Fahey. So he's an amazing American primitive guitar player that sort of took this Smith note, uh, to Smith, uh, took Smith's direction a little bit even further. 
Um, and here's another interesting story for, for a musical project he worked on. In 1964, Smith was held for a week in Anadarko, Oklahoma jail on suspicion of stealing guns. And there he met several Kiowa Indians who introduced him to peyote rituals and songs of the Native American church. In 73, he returned to record them because he heard the music and he liked it, and that's what he did. And he decided to set up his equipment in singers' homes or in his hotel room rather than at an actual ceremony because the Kiowa often sang the songs in casual settings and he would be able to get commentary. And he was also, I think, a little bit worried about um, mixing, taking peyote, and uh, faithfully recording these rituals, which you can imagine m might be challenging. Um, here's a picture of that. Uh, it's called the Kiowa Peyote Meeting, and it's a collection of these recordings. And it shows the range of his interests, right? I mean, he published it on the same record label, uh, I think about 20 years after he published the Anthology of American Folk Music, and it shows the range of his interests and the rigor of you know, how he was capable of applying his, his means of collecting a variety of different genres of music. But he also collected a lot of other things, like eggshells on toilet paper rolls. You can't, really, it's not a, you can't really see it, there's a lot of light, but when you see the slides later, it's literally a box full of eggshells on toilet paper rolls. He collected gourds. These are the boxes from the Getty Museum collection of his collections. Um, tarot decks, he was really into the occult and you know, sacred esoteric knowledge. And one of his other most famous collections is of paper airplanes. Um, he collected so many paper airplanes that he donated them to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Uh, and they had them there for a long time. Now they're at the Getty. Um, but the thing about the way that he collected them was fascinating. He, he collected for years and years found paper airplanes. So he, would, he lived in New York and he would walk all over the place and he would end up finding a lot of paper airplanes, you know? So you never know what you're gonna find if you're not looking for it, right? So I'm gonna show you some of them. Um, they hold fascinating cultural meaning because, uh, as you'll see, the airplanes that he finds reflect of the culture that they were found in. Like this one from 1967, that's, that's on a flyer uh, titled, Many Smokes and Spring Seasonings, published by the Spring Mobilization to End the War in Vietnam in 1967. Or this uh, event from the Cafe Algogo, published by Verve Folkways and the Infinite Poster in 1967. Bob Dylan could have played there. That would have been kind of a cool connection. Um, Demonstrate Against the War, published by the Vietnam Peace Parade Committee in 1967. Here's a paper airplane made from that flyer that he found. Um, a flyer from the Empire State Building. I think people used to like to fold them up off the top of the Empire State Building and throw them off and he would find them somewhere. Uh, a 1978 flyer, a menu from Max's Kansas City, uh, inscribed with the word Excelsior over and over again. And as late as 1982, he was collecting and finding paper airplanes. Here's a page from a child's, like, connect the dots book. Uh, you know, whatever you call it. So besides paper airplanes, he loved string figures. Um, he was really interested in string figures. Here's an awesome picture of him with some string figures. He's really, you know, very photogenic individual. So um, here's him recreating a string figure of some kind. Here's a sketch that he made uh, of a string figure from an unpublished manuscript on string figures that uh, was left behind when he died. So he collected string figures, which is like, a, it's an interesting thing to collect. How do you collect them, right? They're, a, they're an ephemeral thing, but they're a reproducible form because you can compose them, right? So you can start with a string of a known dimension and perform certain operations on them and then end up with that string, right? And so he did that. And so here are some photographs of the ones that he placed. And he would, he would see someone making it, write it down, reproduce it, and photograph it. Um, and they look really cool, so much so that a gallery in Brooklyn in 2012 did an exhibit of, of these photographs and of some recreations from, of facsimiles from his books. So they're really cool. Um, so besides string fingers and paper airplanes and all those other things, he collected images. He was a really famous painter, but also a very, very well-known uh, experimental filmmaker. So uh, he ended up in the Bay Area in the early 60s and was a very well, in the early 50s actually, and ended up being, becoming a very well-known avant-garde filmmaker, making ma perhaps one of the most beautiful and difficult abstract films of all time uh, called Film Number 18. It's also called Mahogany. 
It's a very challenging film to project, a very challenging film to watch. It's very long, it's very abstract, but it shows that he was a collector and a composer. So he used a lot of collected, found imagery. He would find film reels, he would record everyday life, and he would compose it into these grand collages that were meant to invoke you know, this idea of universal consciousness that he was so desperately seeking. Um, here's a couple more stills. This one is more indicative of his abstract work. So he also collected a lot of other things, books, pop-up books, beaded costumes, things shaped like other things, <laughs> including spoons shaped like ducks, banks shaped like apples, and anything shaped like a hamburger. So I think we can all agree that Harry Smith was a master of obsession, which is why I jumped right into telling you this story. Uh, this talk is called The Art of Obsession. My name is Michael Bernstein. Um, <laughs> This is uh, Bang Bang Con. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. This is the requisite title slide. Um, this is my first keynote talk, if you can't tell. And uh, that's enough about me. Let's get back to the subject. So why did I tell you his story? Um, because I'm interested in the following questions, and I wanted an excuse to ask them to you, because you're such a room full of beautiful and intelligent people. So um, what can we learn from Smith's techniques? That's one, one thing that I wanted to ask you. He found satisfaction in, in knowledge and the intersection between his interests, right? So it wasn't that uh, he liked music and he liked film and he liked paper airplanes and he liked string figures, right? He liked connections between things. He liked knowledge and he really, you know, he liked life. Life wasn't always so kind to him, but he really liked it. Uh, and he wanted to experience it to the fullest. Um, so paper airplanes were interesting because of the stories they told as a whole. I mean, each of them is an interesting artifact, right? They're cool, but if I, show, if I said he collected a paper airplane, that would hardly be as fascinating as the fact that he collected so many over such a long period of time over in so many different places. And he actually sat and thought about what that meant. Why did people make them? What did finding them mean? What, what can you... What can you read from a map of reconstructed locations of found paper airplanes over space and time? Um, so painting songs, things that look like other things, they all communicate ideas. They're more than the substance that composes them. So that's one question. Another one is, how can we, how can we master this art of obsession, and why do we want to? It's summed up to me by this quote that we saw from the Getty. I love the writing that they did about his work. So I'm going to read you the same quote twice. Harry Smith liked to look for keys to the universal patterns that shape our cultures and the hidden realms of the human unconscious. Keys to universal patterns. This is the, I really like this phrase the best uh, from the work about him. So we can master the art of obsession by looking for these keys. That's my thesis. And that universal patterns are, com since universal, universal patterns are composed of connections, um, I have a connection that I'd like to share, which is that um, since string figures and knots were some of Smith's favorite things, um, that's a really interesting thing to me. You know, he believed that they held some secrets to universal understanding. Knot tying could be found in many cultures, but not others. And there was a connection in Smith's mind between, you know, how, how cultures and societies communicated with each other through written and spoken language and what kind of knot tying culture they had. Uh, he believed that they worked similarly to how the brain understood written numbers and letters. So Smith was really into knots. Um, and also, computer scientists and mathematicians are also really into knots. Um, this is a figure from a book about term rewriting. And um, this complex unknotting operation that's shown here is composed of various prescribed moves and has parallels to program execution and term rewriting. So you can look at this uh, not untying as a, a complex term that can be normalized to a specific value. Um, and this connection is really deep and interesting to me. Um, and it made me think that uh, A, knots are programs, and they signal uh, at what is interesting about computation. So computation is more than how computers work. Um, computation, our understanding of computation influences how we understand nature and the world around us. It influences how we live and communicate. Um, and it's one of the deepest human achievements um, 
intellectually that we've ever achieved. <laughs> the achievements, you achieve them. That's how you get them. That's how they become achievements, by becoming <laughs> achieved. So, um, so since knots are programs, that leads me to believe that Harry Smith would have loved computer science. Um, it has universal application. Uh, it gets to the heart of so many human problems, uh, even though we don't always talk about it in the most humane terms. Um, it has its own codes, its own languages. It's very esoteric in its own way. And it can be applied in a variety of contexts that are not immediately obvious by uh, looking at it on the surface. And, it, and so if Harry Smith had some advice for us, he probably would have told us to get obsessed and to learn more about it. If we wanted to know more about computer science and we wanted to understand it better, we should probably get really into it. And, and get obsessed in the way that he did by looking at the connections, looking for connections between things, because obsession is crucial uh, to interdisciplinary thinking. Um, if you want to understand one thing deeply and you have your eyes open and are, you know, available to un making connections between the thing that you're studying and the world around you, then you can get a lot further. And Smith demonstrated this in my mind. Um, and the reason we want to think inter interdisciplinarily is because interdisciplinary thinking is crucial to, to advancement. Um, the biggest, most radical achievements within the world of computer science, in my opinion, are those that have made connections to other disciplines and have learned, leveraged those other uh, lessons from those other disciplines. And people that are aware of the world around them can make big radical changes in the way that we think about things uh, as deep, even as deep as computation. And so there's so many possibilities when it comes to computers and computer science, there's a lot of starting points for exploration. There's a lot of things that you could get obsessed with. Um, there are, a, you know, it's very fractal in nature as it's often said, right? You keep studying, uh, you keep studying and studying and studying and you, and you look at what you're studying and you realize, wow, that looked, uh, this looks a lot like what I think I was studying like three months ago and I'm studying <laughs> the same thing but it's somehow different. How am I solving the same problem over and over again? <clears throat> you're in a knot or something like that. If I was a skilled speaker, I would have a knot analogy right now too, but I don't. Um, so what kind of things with computers should we get obsessed with? I really like compilers. Um, they're my favorite type of program lately. I think that compilers are, you know, compilers are the mahogany film number 18 of computer science. <laughs> you know, they're so amazing. They, they, you know, they do everything. Um, we, you know, people spend a lot of time thinking about them and talking about them. If you want to talk to me about, if you want to teach me about how to write a compiler, you can, uh, I'd love to chat with you after this talk. Um, I like type systems a lot lately too. Um, they get to the heart of how we express programs, right? There are these running programs that tell us information about our programs. They tell us what we can and what we cannot express. Um, and they're there whether we want them to be or not. It's sort of this funny thing that you, you can program in one so-called paradigm and be influenced by this idea that uh, you can choose to acknowledge it or not. And it still sort of, to a certain extent, uh, influences what you're capable of expressing in, the, in your language of choice. I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by them, and I think they're one of the deepest, you know, they're, they're clearly one of the deepest connections that we have between computer science and mathematics and logic, for one thing. So I think that Harry Smith probably would have gotten a really big kick out of the idea that uh, programs are really connected to this 1920s logic technology. Um, he probably would have said, uh, told you so, or something like that. Um, static analysis is cool. It's also my day job, but um, Programs that analyze other programs are really interesting to think about, right? I mean, talk about the connections between things. So I, I want to write my, I'm going to write a program in one language that tells you information about the program that you wrote in another language. Because the language that I'm writing in is good for telling you things about your programs, but I wouldn't want to write the kinds of programs that you write in the language that you write them in, <laughs> or something, right? So that's a whole, that's a lot. That's a big that's a big bag that I'd be careful before I open that one up if I were you. <laughs> Logic programming is really cool. Um, you can solve problems that you didn't know you have. Um, <laughs> And, and, and in understanding and learning how to logic pro use logic programming, you can shatter, shatter your narrow paradigm worldviews. I have a lot of exclamation points in my notes. Just my title was lacking one, so I felt like I needed to make up for them. I'm not speaking in a very exclamatory way right now, but they're there. 
I've spoken a lot and thought a lot about distributed systems, and they're also cool. And they're also one of those really fractal problems, because the same problems that you have, quote unquote, locally appear uh, in a distributed way in a really different and interesting, the properties slightly change, in other words. Things look different when you see them from afar, and then you stare at them for a while, and they kind of look the same, but not, not quite. There's, that's what abstraction is, I guess. Um, so you should study them. Uh, the world is already distributed. It's time to catch up. Exclamation point. Um, programming language theory. It encompasses a lot of other things. Programming language theorists and type theorists have this cool ability to somehow talk about philosophy, but now you're in the context of computer science, right? So when you're thinking about how we express the, how we interact with, what is our interface to com computation and to computers, it's through these languages, right? So they're clearly very powerful. Um, and they, and it's well known that, you know, the language that you use influences what you can express, right? That's sort of a given, but it also influences how you think about computation in general. So you speak enough in a certain language and you think you can communicate certain things, you write enough programs in a certain programming language and it influences how you, how you think for a long time. You know, I learned, I learned uh, very not, uh, I've learned very uninteresting things when I was learning how computer programming worked. Um, I wish that I had learned, you know, other paradigms first because then I would, uh, you know, not have such a broken brain right now. But um, anyway, yeah, how you learn really influences uh, what you think. And so, and programming language theory encompasses a lot of that. So, how do you learn all of those things? How do you get obsessed and stay, obs and stay obsessed? How do you understand these subjects in a way that will lead you to find the types of connections that Smith made and was so good at making? So here's a little bit of advice on my take on that. This is my impractical guide to the art of obsession. So the first uh, piece of advice is to follow the links. So find a resource. Uh, look for the influences and connections between these resources and disciplines. Here's a, here's a metaphor for that. Um, your favorite band growing up liked music that you thought was terrible, right? So I have a really funny story. How many people like, uh, how many people like the band Black Flag? as like punk rock music, hardcore music. So you know who they are at least. If you don't, that's okay. They're a really famous band and they were like really tough. Uh, they were from California and they thought that they were really cool. They were. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they were really cool. The, the lead guitarist had a dirty secret though. He loved the Grateful Dead. Um, they were his favorite band. Uh, he wore Grateful Dead t-shirts and Black Flag vans had Grateful Dead stickers on them and people thought like that he was kidding. You know? <laughs> and so like these punks would beat up hippies and would be wearing Black, black Flag t-shirts when they were doing so, right? And so the, the idea there is that, you know, it's not enough to learn what your influencers teach you, right? You, you need to look back at what influenced them in order to understand how they arrived at that conclusion. That's a, real, that's a fundamental component to understanding um, how the world works, how computation works, and in order to make those connections, you have to be willing to step further than what's obvious and out of your comfort zone. Because I love the Grateful Dead and Black Flag a lot. They're, they're both really great. Um, yeah, cool, I'm glad I got to tell that story. So open your eyes. Be open to connections to your interests in unlikely places. This kind of goes with that. Like, not only, you know, when you're doing something completely different, be open to the idea that you might learn something about what you're not expecting to learn about. Um, I've gotten a lot out of that, and I think Smith did too. Uh, he heard things in, you know, he saw patterns in Ukrainian Easter eggs that were also present in, you know, whatever other beaded, uh, you know, things that he was studying. So I, I missed it from the quote, but you get my idea, I hope. Um, pursue discomfort. Um, regularly consult texts and concepts that are too hard for you. You know, pick it up. Don't be afraid. You know, uh, if it's a heavy book, the worst that will happen is that you'll drop it on your foot. Um, and it won't get damaged, though, because it's a really big book. And it's fine, so <laughs> your foot will also heal. Um, pick up that book and just look at what the shape of those things are that are too hard for you and, and like stare at the page that's 
impossible for you to understand and remember that feeling. Because then when you study uh, and you get past that and you squash it, right? You know, you squash that discomfort and you learn, then you get to feel really good, right? You're like, ha ha, I don't remember when this looked like absolute gibberish to me and now I'm talking about it on Twitter like I'm an authority. <laughs> <laughs> so, over time, watch, uh, watch them become understandable as you work hard and learn. Uh, trust yourself because you're awesome, exclamation point. Um, you know, if you don't trust yourself um, and you're lucky enough to have other people that trust you, you'll, you, you'll probably still be okay, but if you, don't, you, know, if you really want to get as far as you can, you need to be the one to convince yourself that you're doing the right thing and it's okay to do the wrong thing. You'll do many more wrong things than right things. Um, if you follow Harry Smith's example, especially. <laughs> Contact your heroes. Um, this is a good one, because they want to teach and learn also. You know, they have things to learn from you. Whatever you've done in your life is definitely not the same as whatever your hero has done, right? You think about individuals that accomplish things as, you know, somehow projections of those things that they've accomplished, but actually they're just bags of meat, like you are. Um, and they want to be friends with you and talk to you, most likely. And if they don't, then that's their loss, not yours. You have as much to teach as you have to learn. And that's a really important thing to remember. People want to know what you think about the work that they've done. That's why they do it, um, whether they want to admit it or not. I've had a lot of awesome experiences, particularly in the world of academic computer science, where as a complete, as an outsider, you know, I just write something, and then guess what? The author finds it because they Google themselves. <laughs> you know, and they're like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna Google this paper that I wrote and see who's, see what the pundits have to say about it." <laughs> Pundit. <laughs> and and it feels really good. You know, it's like they're like, "Hey, thanks for reading my paper." I'm like, "Yeah, well, thanks for writing that paper. That was cool." What other papers have you written? You want to, you know, what other books should I? Read? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, and for, forget what is practical. Um, it's important to pursue concepts past the point of simple applicability. Don't just, don't just learn the thing and then use it and then walk away from it, right? And once you've learned it, or at least a part of it, you're in a pretty good position to, I don't know, understand how it was made, why it was made that way, make your own decisions about how that thing should have been made, make it yourself, never use it again, <laughs> talk about it on Twitter, whatever. <laughs> Uh, and then remember what is practical, because uh, it's good to ship software, too, and to do things, um, as opposed to talking about them all the time. Um, you can, uh, yeah, I'm going to stand by that. You should also do things. Don't just talk about them. It's really good. Feeling, doing things feels great. Um, I've done it a couple times. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then, at the, in the end, I guess, the advice is to be a, at least a little bit more like Harry. Don't be too much like him. He, he disregarded his life and his physical form uh, more than I would want for any of you. Um, so um, embrace the world around you and learn. Get obsessed, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>